This has been a, uh, the last couple weeks have been, there's just been a lot kind of going on with me. And, um, you know, last week was one of those milestone birthdays. So I'm going to let you guys um, um, walk with me through some things. But I want to start by reading Psalms 145. This is one of my favorite Psalms. Just kind of, in one respect, it sums up my life in certain ways, but in other ways, I think it's just a, a great declaration. As David writes this, he says, My heart explodes with praise for you. Now and forever, my heart bows in worship to you, my King and my God. Every day I will lift up praise to your name with praise that will last throughout eternity. Your words don't end. The praise that we've lifted up today ripple through all of eternity. They don't stop. They don't stop. It doesn't end when the service ends. Lord, you are great and worthy of the highest praise, for there is no end to the discovery of the greatness that surrounds you. Generation after generation will declare more of your greatness and declare more of your glory. Your magnificent splendor and miracles of your majesty are my constant meditation. Your awe-inspiring acts of power have everyone talking. I'm telling people everywhere about your excellent greatness. Our hearts bubble over with, as we celebrate the fame of your marvelous beauty, bringing bliss to our hearts. We shout with ecstatic joy over your breakthrough for us. You're kind and tender-hearted to those who don't deserve it and very patient with people who fail you. Your love is like a flooding river overflowing the banks with kindness. God, everyone sees your goodness, for your tender love is blended into everything you do. Everything you have made will praise you, fulfilling its purpose, and all your godly lovers will be found bowing before you. They will tell the world of the lavish splendor of your kingdom and preach about your limitless power. They will demonstrate for all to see your miracles of might and reveal the glorious majesty of your kingdom. You are the Lord who reigns over your, your never-ending kingdom through all the ages of time and eternity. You are faithful to, to, to fulfill every promise you've made. You manifest yourself as kindness in all you do. Weak and feeble ones, you will sustain. Those bent over with burdens of shame, you will lift up. You have captured our attention, and the eyes of all look to you. You give what they hunger, you give what they hunger for at just the right time. When you open your glorious, or when you, <laughs> it's glorious, but when you open your generous hand, it's full of blessings, satisfying the longings of every living thing. You are fair and righteous in everything you do, and your love is wrapped into all your works. You draw near to those who call to you, listening closely, especially when their hearts are true. Every one of your godly lovers receives even more than what they ask for. For you hear what their hearts really long for, and you bring them your saving strength. God, you watch carefully over all your lovers like a bodyguard, but you will destroy the ungodly. I will praise you, Lord. Let everyone everywhere join me in praising the beautiful Lord of holiness from now through eternity. That's just one of my, my favorite verses. I don't know how many times I've, or uh, psalms, I don't know how many times I've preached this psalm or pieces of this psalm. And I, I was all set to like jump back into the whiteboard, but I'm going to not do that today. I'm going to take a risk. For those that you remember last week, I'm going to take a risk. But now, I, there's been, there's been uh, these last couple months for me has been interesting. There's some things that um, have stirred in my heart, and um, I just sense the Lord saying today, why don't you, instead of preaching, why don't you just share a testimony? And I thought, 
okay, I think I can do that if I can do that. Um, and uh, so I'm going to cover a couple different areas. Where, but where I'm going to start was just an interesting thing for me. As I said, I just turned 65 this past week. My father died when he was 64. And dad died of cancer. Uh, he was a lifelong smoker and died from mouth cancer. Dad would have been 65 in, in, in November. November 6th was his birthday. So he would have, now he's been dead for 25, 26 years. But dad would have been 65 that November. He was diagnosed with cancer on Good Friday of that year. And I can't tell you what that year is right now. You'll have to do the math. Um, but he was diagnosed with, with cancer on Good Friday, was operated on at Sloan Kettering Hospital in New York, which at the time was one of the leading cancer hospitals in the country and probably even the world. I mean, if you were really bad off, Sloan Kettering was where you tried to get to. So dad was, re, was accepted there, had surgery, um, and it really... Um, it never really made much of a difference other than it put him in a really difficult spot physically. Um, I'd never witnessed anybody go through mouth cancer before. It was horrendous. Um, and at that time, I don't know what it is now, but at that time, the recovery rate from mouth cancer was about 5% of those that can... Because there's so much of your whole body that goes through your mouth. So if it's here... It's just everywhere. So they did the surgery, did the reconstruction, did all that stuff. He came home, started getting uh, chemo and radiation at uh, PGH in Salisbury. And it never even, I mean, they're, they're, well, those of you that have walked through this, you know how radiation, severe radiation is. So... Dad's going through that, and the cancer is growing at a vengeful rate the whole time. So eventually there's that point where, you know, the doctors just say, there's nothing we can do. There's no point in doing any treatment, and Dad came home. And he died that October, just a couple weeks before he would have been 65. So his story is not my story. I haven't been a lifelong smoker. Linda thankfully gave up cigars a years ago. <laughs> And so I haven't even been subject to secondhand smoke. Um, but, and it, and that, which is why it struck me odd. But there, I went through this period, and I'm not a depressive person. I'm not somebody that, I am melancholy, but I'm not depressive. And I, coming through uh, Jan, December and January of this year, I started thinking about, wow, my father was this age when he died. And as I said, dad's been dead over 25 years. So it's not, you know, it's not like I needed a sozo at that point to find out, okay, well, what's hidden, what's buried? I mean, I'm, I'm fine with my father being in heaven. I mean, it was just we saw miracle after miracle happen, not on the healing side, but on relational stuff. Uh, a lot of things got done in a short period of time at my father's due diligence, really. Um, and I've said here before, Dad and I didn't have a good relationship most of, well, all of our lives. But what my father didn't teach me in living, he taught me in his dying. Because he showed me and demonstrated how you die well. And to that, I am very, very grateful. Um, just... And that, you know, just things that he walked through, how he, how he conducted himself was, to me, just amazing. Um, but then I found myself in this place going, ah. so, Dad, right here, this week, you know, this is back in January. So this, this week, Dad was just weeks from dying. And, and all the, the, the memories of 25 years, 26 years ago all kind of came back. And I found myself reliving a lot of those last months before Dad died. And then um, the night that my father died, it just so happened we were all there, we, my whole family, 
and a couple close friends. And I would not have been there that night. I had to come home from work. It was a Monday night. And, you know, we all knew that death was imminent. But we just, you know, typical thing. You just don't know what day it's going to be or when it's going to be. And I came home Monday from work. It was a long day. I was tired. All I wanted to do was call it a night. And Linda's like, we should go see your father. I'm like, ah, I'm not going to go see Dad tonight. We'll go tomorrow night. I mean, tomorrow is going to be an easier day. I'm just tired. We were living up here at Williamsville, and Mom and Dad live in Lewis. And so I'm like, I don't feel like that's a half hour drive down. And then we're going to, you know, I had all my reasons. And everything in my head, Tuesday was much preferable than Monday, except for my wife. who said, we're going to go see your dad. Like, All right, well, then you're driving. I don't care. Get in the car. We're going to go see your dad. So off we go. So we got there, and, and, and he was, um, when we got there, hospice was there, and the nurse was like, yeah, it's just a matter of hours at this point. So, you know how it is when you're, you're sitting through a death watch. You go and you sit with a person or stand with a person for a little while, and then emotionally that's kind of, you hit that point, so then we all go back to the kitchen, you have another cup of coffee, you tell a few jokes, you laugh a little bit, you try to divert your attention away from what's happening in the next room. You know, and then at a certain point, you get up and you migrate back into the room and you, you do that again, and, and it's, you, know, you do that dance. And uh, the nurse came in at uh, one point, and we're all in the kitchen, and she came in, and she goes, "Um, now would be a good time if you want to say goodbye. Now would be a good time to do that. So 10 of us, I don't know how many, any of us, yeah, 10 of us or so that were there. Everybody that needed to be there was there. And when, we, when all of us talked about how we had arrived there Monday night, it was none by plan. Everybody said, well, I just thought I'd stop by. Or in our case, my wife told me I had to be there. Uh, however we got there, but it was nobody had just marked it on their calendar, I'm going to go see Walt tonight. But there we are. And we all gathered around the bed, held hands, um, said goodbye prayed, and dad was gone. Now, it doesn't always happen that way, but that's how it happened for us, which was an incredible moment. Because I've said it here before, but if, if, if my faith doesn't sustain me in that moment, I don't have any faith. I don't know what I'm believing, but it's not what I've been reading in the book. It's not what I've been singing about. It's not what I've set my heart towards. Because somehow in that moment, we get to watch heaven and earth meet. And another son received. And we get to actually be there in that moment and experience it. And it's rich. It's rich. And for some of us, we can live our whole life running away from death. I got news for you. You can run away from it if you want. It's going to catch you. That's the one thing you can't ignore. Somehow, some way, sometime, it shows up. So we said goodbye, and Dad... That was off. So I'm, I'm, I'm processing all that this year, going, why is this, like, really bothering me? It's not bothered me like this before. And obviously, there's the parallel. I'm turning 65. Dad would have turned 65. So at this point, I've outlived my father. And I'm figuring at this point, since I've passed him, I'm going for the marathon. So I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to eat better. I'm trying to exercise. I'm doing all that stuff. And it's working. It's working. But if I'm going to be around, I, I want to go for the long haul. 
Yeah, and I'm going to die healthy. Um, I just got, at 65, I was just having this conversation with somebody who I don't even know, which is always uncomfortable for me, but they, this person just starts talking to me, and they're talking about retiring and telling me all about what they're going to do when they're retiring. And, well, how old are you? I said, well, I just turned 65. Oh, oh. Well, what are you going to do? I said, same thing I was doing yesterday. <laughs> I, 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 I don't have another plan, man. I said, I'm just going to keep running till, till I can't run anymore. I, said, I, got, and I started telling them about Africa. I said, here I am, 65 years old, and, and the continent of Africa is opening up. I keep saying, Lord, this would have been nice when I was 25. Yeah, that was the problem. He goes, hey, did you see you at 25? <laughs> you think I was going to give you Africa at 25? <laughs> I had all I could do to give you a little house on the side of the road and have confidence you could handle it. <laughs> I was like, all right. I thought I was doing pretty good at 25. He goes, yeah, well, you were cute. You were cute. I'll, I'll give you that. But <laughs> so, so that was the first thing. I'm, I'm pondering all of this. And then uh, this week, McKenna turned 14. And I posted it on Facebook for those of you that follow such stuff. Um, I had a picture on my phone that popped up of McKenna at her seventh birthday had these two little cute pink flamingos on her head. And that's another whole story that I won't go into. The term cute and being very generous with that term. Not McKenna, the pink flamingos. And and I'm looking I'm looking at her and her smile and just you know, again, reminiscing. And, and it struck me with something, and this, this quote isn't from me, and I can't tell you where I saw it, but it did not originate with me. But they said, one of the things that children remind us of is what we're not. And I realized that with McKenna. At 14, I mean, and I celebrate everything that's happening in her life, but what I realize is where she is I can never go back to that point. I'm 65 and the timeline only goes in one direction. Um, and, and, that's, I, and again, that's not in like this mournful, uh, just I was depressed for days because I wasn't. But it made me think. It made me look. It made me ponder. Seven years went by like that. I mean, here is this cute little seven-year-old, and now I'm looking at a 14-year-old that's as, almost as tall as I am. And at 14, I could have, or at seven, I could have certain conversations with her, and that was as far as you could go because she was seven years old, and I didn't expect her to talk to me any different than a seven-year-old. At 14, we have some really incredible conversations, and I know I'm biased. She's a really sharp young woman, and, uh, and it's been a joy watching her grow, but it's made me aware of things again. Some has just made me aware of my own mortality. And, uh, but this reason why I read Psalms 145 and why it's, it's dear to me, and this is going to take me to the next, to the next piece of this wandering this morning. It speaks about us that we, we talk about the miracles of God, the power of God, the awesomeness of God. We give that from generation to generation. One generation will tell the next of the goodness of God. There is this thing that's generational about us. And I, again, it's like I find myself here 
at this juncture in life and I look at this community of people and I, and I can tell you without reservation that there is few nights in a week that I don't see all your faces. I don't purpose to do that. It just happens. Because you are so much in my heart that when my heart speaks, you're the voices that come out. And I'm really thankful for that. I am blessed. More than you could know. And you know, we, we can walk through life in, um, you know, we can, we can walk through life and we want things to be smooth. We want them to be easy. We want them to be without conflict. And I'm all for that. We all need to live in that fairyland from time to time. And if you need to see God as the little fairy going along with the little, you know, fractured fairy tale thing, you can do that for a little bit. But then slap yourself and come back to reality, you know, as, uh, as has been said by many, you know, we can, we can, um, we can, talk about the love of God, we can talk about the mercy of God, we can talk about all these wonderful benefits and attributes of God that are absolutely true. But when I start defining love, just keep in mind that the good Father, the loving Father, is also the Lion of Judah. It's not two different gods. And when we start to slide to this place where God becomes so fuzzy that all he's really there for is just to make my life comfortable and better and everything, all my plans work and all that, we're missing who he is. We're missing the God that talks to us from the scriptures. Who is the Lion of Judah? who actually does have an opinion. And his opinion isn't my opinion. My opinion can align with his opinion, but my opinion doesn't change his opinion. He is moving his kingdom forward, and he's invited me to be a part of that. And he's said that, if you'll say yes to this invitation, there's a whole lot of benefit that comes to you. If you say no to this invitation, do I still love you? Yes, I do. Did I die for you? Yes, I did. Do the benefits I speak of just come to you? No, they don't. No, they don't. He's a rewarder of those that diligently pursue him. And so I, I've, I've reflected on my life here for, you know, I got saved when I was 17 years old. And so I've reflected on some things. And we've told many stories here about the history of being here. Um, I don't know if these next couple stories I'm going to tell you um, have been said before, but they're, they're stories that came up in my, in my remembrance over these last two weeks. Um, This amazing experiment called the house has been my lifelong point of focus. And nothing I'm saying in any way am I saying this to, you know, build me up or anything like that. I'm just, this is just the way it is. This is the way that it worked. This is who I am. This is who you are. Somehow we've all been brought together 
with an assignment for this time to make a difference, to be a voice, to be the light, you know, all that. So when this thing started, um, and you know, it started in our living room, it started as a Bible study, it was never intended to be a church, I, dis- I wasn't all that crazy about being a pastor, I worked for the state of Delaware, I lear- liked working for the state of Delaware most of the time, um, and But one of the things that in our genesis as a church, as we transition from this Bible study to an actual calling ourselves a church and then trying to figure out what what does a New Testament model of a church look like, um, we've had countless missteps and made various mistakes. And um, so... There was, a, there was a time very early on, like for me, I, I, whenever I think, whenever my brain starts working, it always thinks in terms of a team. It just happens. I, I, I don't know how to visualize life differently. I know people that do. I meet with some of them that do it that way. And as the expression goes, we really don't see eye to eye. Because <laughs> people that think in terms of teams and people that think in terms of I are very different thinkers. And they approach every circumstance differently. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know, like a year or two ago, uh, Mount Schultz, Eric Reeder, Darby Slayton, and I were sitting around our dining room table doing this morning uh, brainstorming session and having a blast. And at a certain point, Eric had been really challenging me on some things he thought I should develop personally. And and it was a good challenge, but he was challenging me. And Darby was too. They were both pushing Fount and I uh, about some things we should develop. So I'm listening and I'm taking notes. And so at a certain point, I'm like, well, yeah, okay, Eric, I see what you're saying. So what we can do is we can then, and I start to lay out the plan of we. And I'm, I mean, in all earnestness, I'm putting this out. And Eric sits back in his chair and he starts laughing at me. And he goes, you can't do it, can you? I said, do what? I said, I'm, I'm giving back to you. I listened. I'm giving back to you. And he goes, no, no, no. He goes, you can't do it. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. He goes, you can't do it without a team, can you? And I'm like, well, no. He goes, well, I just, I just wanted to put that out there because everything you're talking about is all with we. And you don't even have a we yet. But you've already got the we there. I'm like, well, it can't happen without we. He goes, you just can't do it. And then he goes, but I love that about you. So I'm not trying to tell you you can't do it that way. I just want you to be aware of how you're thinking. And that was really helpful to me. um, Because I do think that way. I don't know how to think differently. I can't... if I couldn't take all of you along, I don't really want to go. Yeah, what's the point? I mean, I, you know, I, I just, I have no interest in that. I'm, I'm so excited that Elijah gets to go with me to Africa this time. I can't wait for more of you to go. I can't wait for all of you to inherit the, the continent with me. It's going to be amazing. Because I just don't know how to do it differently. It's uh, the, you know. Okay, so um, so this this story that came up, and maybe this will be helpful to some. I don't, I'm not really sure why the Holy Spirit highlighted it like this, but um, in these in one of these early times of trying to create a team, as we also know, teams are great. The wrong people on the team is horrible. 
So in my early zeal to have a team, if you're breathing, you're qualified. It took me a while to learn. Not everybody breathing, do you want them around you? Yeah, as a team member. Some people have bad breath, and you're not going to change that. Don't have them on the team. Well, I was still learning this lesson. So I had assembled this church leadership team of warm bodies, and we were going to be the leadership of what was then called Williamsville Christian Fellowship. The problem with the team was not everybody on the team thought in terms of we. And a few of them were pretty sure I was not qualified to be the pastor, but they were. Which leads to some interesting dynamics. So this power struggle begins. And it, it got so heated, and, and the power struggle, struggle was actually first launched and then encouraged by our intercessor. Because we weren't very big then. We only had one intercessor. And that was one too many. <laughs> because she was sure that the Lord was telling her that this other person was supposed to be the pastor. And he happened to be... Um, full of himself enough to think she was right. And she might have been right. So my view was, then go start a church. They're doing it every day. This is how it works. <laughs> this is why churches get started. Okay. Okay. We've got that much. Go start a church. But he wanted this church. And I wasn't ready to give it up. So this interesting dynamic started, and we had this major coming together of this newly formed leadership team, along with the intercessor, which I didn't invite, but the other person invited Kind of like the city manager needing to have a witness in the room. And back then, you couldn't record things on your phone, so they walk in with like this boom box. Remember boom boxes? <laughs> it's this thing like this, right? Because it had a cassette recorder in it. So they come walking in and boom, set it on the table to say, for all of our safety, we're going to record the meeting. Chikul. I said, did you put in a 30, a 60, or a 120? Just let me know. <laughs> Just let me know here. If you want this tape full, we can fill it up, you know. And it was a very, it, was a, it turned into a very ugly meeting, as we all know those types of meetings, whether it's church-related or not. They can get really ugly really fast. Um, and when the meeting was done, they turned off the boom box, and those two marched out uh, telling me they would give me a copy of the tape, to which I responded, I don't need a copy of the tape. Because <laughs> I don't intend to review anything that was said here tonight again. And I was pretty sure when that was all done and everybody left that night, I was ready to just call it a day and like this whole church thing, this whole pastoring thing, I'm done with it because I got a job that I'm working at that when I walk in in the morning, the secretary goes, good morning, Mr. Muncie, how are you today? And I get to say, I'm doing well, really well, Evelyn, how are you doing? And she likes me <laughs> and they pay me. To show up. 
you don't like me and you're not paying me squat. <laughs> and I'm supposed to put up with this? I think I'll just work on my retirement. I got plenty of years left with the state. Hang in there. Life will be good. So I was having real serious questions about, like, do I even want to show up next Sunday? But I had to because they were meeting in my house. <laughs> yeah. Where's Bob? Hey, he's in bed. Bed. <laughs> I think it's the flu. You don't want to go in the room. You might. I'm sure he's contagious. Um, but giving you the backstory, and this is this is uh, where where I really want to land. I think on this. So, out of that whole group, then there was one person who was a very close friend of Linda and I's, and he was getting married, and I was doing the wedding. <laughs> And it was up in the big city of Viola, if any of you even know where Viola is. But we were there in the big city of Viola at, I don't even know what the building was. Uh, um, yeah, it's, uh, it wasn't the VFW, it was like a century club or something or something up there. It wasn't a church. But anyway, we do this wedding. And then there's the reception. So Linda and I, Jennifer and Heather, who were we at that time, um, we go in, we sit at a table. And the rest of the people from our church came in, you know, trickled in, and they all sat at another table. And they had some kids with them. And so our kids were like, can we go sit at that table. And I was like, no, no, I can't explain to you right now why. But you just need to sit here with us. Because something's unfolding, and I don't know what it is. And it hurts really, really bad right now. But we're going to sit at this table. And the best we can, we're going to try to love the people that sit at the other table. Although there's a part of me that wants to throat punch two of them. Yeah. <laughs> Just saying. You don't understand the great restraint that you're witnessing right now in Jesus' name. Because, yeah. And they're all laughing it up and so on. And that whole reception, no one from our church spoke to us at all. Wow. And then they left, and we left, and the next Sunday, I had to stand up in front of those people and do what I'm doing now. Wow. So this is what I've discovered in 65 years. Sometimes the blue bird of happiness craps on your head. And it kind of runs down right here, right off your nose. And you're going to live through it. Amen. Wipe it off. Amen. Smile. Because, yeah, adjust your heart. Yeah, definitely keep your mouth closed. <laughs> because <laughs> what I can tell you now and I couldn't tell you then because I couldn't see it but what I can tell you now is my ability to love is built on that foundation because something in God when we just say Having done all to stand, yes. I'm just going to stand. Come on. I'm just going to stand. Yes. And when we do, what we read in the Psalms, what we sing about, what we talk about, the God that is, yeah. is drawn to us. 
He is the author and the finisher of my faith. He is the lifter of my head. He is the one that will defend my reputation if it needs to be defended. And other gifts I've had along the way of 65 years is there's been times that my reputation has been trashed and it was all right because I was too attached to it anyway. Yeah, and I was probably a tad inflated. Just, just maybe that much. But what I do know is my loving father knows how to love me better than any person I've ever met. And somehow he works these things out. Um, he gives us insight. He gives us understanding. We get to see his faithfulness. We get to see his love. You know, I, I wish no one ill at any point. I, I just, I want everybody to do well. I want everybody to succeed. I mean, life, life has a lot of good things in it. And I want people to get it. Because God's in that. And somehow when, when, his, when people can receive goodness, there's something that changes in their heart and gives them uh, an ability to receive something that maybe they couldn't receive before. But I, I don't know any of us that haven't walked through tough times. I don't know any of us that haven't, you know, whether we've stood at the bedside of, of a friend or a relative that is breathing their last breath or we've stood at a grave and, and said goodbye. You know, to someone that left way too early. Life is life. But God is God. And I can say he's a good father. Not, not just because I memorized that verse. And I can say he's a good father because I've known his goodness. I've experienced it. And what I've seen is his desire is to give us capacity to hold more of him. And the capacity I had at 25 wasn't big enough to hold Africa. I'm not even sure at 65 it's big enough to hold Africa. But I know now it's at least big enough to hold a dream and hold it well. And that's where he wants all of us to get to. Um, one final thing, and this, this is because some of you have brought this up at different times. Um, uh, those of you that know Doug Johnson, some of you do. Um, Doug's just become a really good friend of mine through some other stuff that's not really good. But in the midst of it, I discovered Doug. So I'm like, okay, well, that's not a bad extension. I, can, I, I like Doug. And Doug likes me, which is helpful. We're both we people. So we like getting together and talk about that. So Doug and I were talking this week. We've actually been talking quite a bit this week. But on one of our conversations, we got talking about being a spiritual father. And one of the problems that we see, because Doug and I are about the same age, one of the problems we see is that in the current climate, of the church. There's been this rush for everybody, or I, that's too big. There's been this rush for a lot of people to come forward saying they're a spiritual father. And they've created huge messes and they've hurt a lot of people claiming to be a spiritual father. I don't know what the, the ripe old age is where you can actually be a spiritual father. And I, I'm not even comfortable with the whole term spiritual father. It doesn't really work well for me. Um, just refer to me as your old friend. Uh, <laughs> but we've, we've watched this happen and people get hurt, people get... And, and, the whole term spiritual father gets used in a very manipulative way, a very diabolical way, 
and a lot of just bad stuff has happened by this term. But Doug and I, as we've been kicking this around, it's like, if we accept the term spiritual father, um, I don't think any of us can even remotely put ourselves in a place where we, uh, we make ourselves available to somebody that way until you can say, let me show you the scars. And if I can't tell the story of my scars with love, I'm not ready to be a spiritual father to anybody. So I don't know how old you have to get or how many scars you have to have before you cross the line, but it's more than two. You know? And actually, Doug and I are... We're just, we're just starting to kick around the idea, but I think the two of us are going to actually collaborate on a book together on spiritual fatherhood in the kingdom and what's, what's right and what's wrong with it because I, I get wanting to try to experiment, but my goodness, we've got to do a much better job than this. And... So Doug and I feel like some of us that are, we've got the scars. So let's tell the story. And so I don't know, I don't know what, how it's all going to work, but the thought of doing a, co-writing a book with Doug is, sounds like an awful lot of fun. So we'll see how all that works out. But um, so those are kind of my, some of my ramblings today. I, that's my testimony. Um, y- you... Uh, It's just such a great privilege to be able to stand in front of y'all and do what I get to do what I get to do and live out what I get to live out with you. Uh, You all make my life rich. And to be at 65 and say, okay, you know, I've been I've been at this, this here, the house from our living room with no name to becoming Williamsville Christian Fellowship, to moving to Lollipop Land, to coming here, at at each of the steps that we have taken. A few of you here have been here from the beginning. Others of you have come along at different stages of the ride. Um, If I can say it this way, and you can hear me in my words what I mean, but you are the result of my lifelong work. And I'm very satisfied. Just very satisfied when I look around at you, the we, the we. And with that, I don't have any place to go, so I'm going to walk out kind of slow today. Uh, If you need prayer, come up and have prayer. Uh, Bob won't be left on the front row going, I don't know what to do. He didn't tell me he was going to do that. (laughs) But bless you all. Thank you. And we'll uh, chat and chew us tomorrow night. And um, so, yeah. Hallelujah. Stand up. Say hi to everybody, and at some point, go home.